There we go. There you go. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm Indy. That guy way over there is Jay. And this guy in the middle is David Logan from Aquapara hey. Games. Aquapara Games. And we're here our, to talk about... Bright and Early Show. Yeah, the Bright and Early Show. We're here to talk about publisher stuff. Why you should so, get a publisher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or yeah, if you should. David did an awesome article a couple of weeks ago on Medium, which is why I reached out to him originally and said, do you want to come on the show and, and talk about that to our developers? And so he thankfully agreed, and here we are. Right, um, I'll, I'll post that link. The rest is history. Exactly. Do you want to go through the news real quick while I finish discording? Sure. Well, just to be fair, everything that's ever happened ever is history. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see here. What do we got for news? We got, well, first let's talk about the, do you have the things about the Twitch's changes? About I didn't Amazon it. Prime, you didn't post it. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pull it up real quick. Amazon Prime, there's some changes coming to Twitch Prime, Amazon Prime changes. Um, a lot of people are mad about it. A lot of people don't care, you know. Uh, the changes are, dang it, I can't, now I can't even find an article about it. Twitch Prime members will lose ad-free viewing next month. It, it, it's going to change a lot of things. Here, I'll just post a link from the verb here. Tallner, only if it was recorded, then it's history. <laughs> um, Basically, we get we get less perks now. Right. Well, it could just kind of, Twitch says it's eight ninety nine per month. Turbo subscription will still offer ad-free viewing. So you'll have to have a turbo, which is what I had for a long time. Um, I didn't even know turbo was a thing. Yeah, that's why you see the little turbo badges on people's chats. It's a, like a little purple thing. <clears throat> uh, uh, I, important. It's a, so Twitch essentially foot the foot the bill for the complimentary four ninety nine monthly sub as part of Twitch Prime, and also let millions of users forego advertising that it would otherwise get a cut of. So Twitch itself is also financially benefiting from removing this perk, although the free monthly subscription as part of Prime is remaining. And then there's other things that's happening as well, like the uh, pre-order stuff, and and a lot of people are ticked off about it. I'm, I, and obviously you've been around Twitter, uh, not Twitter, Twitch a lot longer than I have, but even I'm not overly happy about this. I mean, it's just somebody on Twitter summed it up perfectly, and they were, or maybe it was on Reddit. And they were like, hey, you know, you can pay for Twitch Prime and you get ad free viewing. And then like later, it's like, oh, well, you know, now you can pay for something else to get your ad free viewing. And over the last couple of years, it just seems like I've seen more things that make Amazon Prime worth it be taken away. And they're adding stuff that I don't really care about. I mean, it could be great for somebody else, but it doesn't phase me one bit. Kind of the, just a bait, a bait and switch almost. Like, it you know, is. It come is. Come in, get all these great perks, and then just yeah. get in. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, thanks for the follow, by the way. Um, yeah, because it used to be you had tur Twitch Turbo. That was all you had. That was the one subscription thing you could get to give you ad free viewing. I think a lot of people just go back to ad block. <laughs> well, but I still have ad block. <laughs> all, these, all these websites now are, if you want to read our article, turn off ad block. There was, I, I saw, you know, in the follow up to that announcement that there's several big streamers that are saying, you know, when that happens, they're going to turn on ad free viewing for subscribers. So if you subscribe to their channel, you know, you'll get ad free, you know, viewing because it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's like, you know, Indy, you shared how much you make on ads a month and it was, you know, it won't even buy you a cup of coffee at right. Starbucks. Right. So where is all this, you know, new revenue for, you know, indie teams coming from? It's like, I don't think it is. I right. don't think there's any, it's just Twitch wanting to, you know, get more money. Right. I mean, my, my channels is not huge by comparison. I mean, but I mean, like the other night I had 300 viewers and then sometimes I'll have like 40. So my channel is not huge, but my channel is still like the, 99% of people don't get more than, you know, 10 viewers. So, and, and as much as I, I've, like I was sharing with Jay, I've made like $4 in ads. I don't run ads during the stream. It just automatically does pre-rolls and post-rolls. So it's like, 
how much money is that really that they are what what's i just wonder what the benefit is because it's i don't i don't use amazon prime so i don't i mean i kind of don't have an opinion about it because it doesn't directly affect me but i can see how people are pissed for sure are, are you on prime david yeah i'm on prime and i i kind of agree with you like they're they're you know the price keeps increasing 20 bucks every year and they're not really adding anything that i want they're just adding kind of extra fluff and they're like well you know we had to increase the price because we're adding all these extra features well why not just make the features you know be able to choose which features you want for a lower price rather than paying you know kind of a huge price for for everything and then not using 80 percent of it i wish the cable network worked like that like there's 300 channels i just want to pay like two dollars a month per channel and then pick my channels or whatever you know i wish i wish it would be nice if it worked like that for sure because then is i might the, use prime is they um none of the ones like youtube tv or anything do like that because i thought i had read somewhere a while back that there was some service that was going to kind of go to that whole uh you know a la carte methodology on on picking your channels but you know it, it is it's and it's similar because you know that's how cable companies do it they you know put what they know you want in this bundle with a bunch of other crap that you you're never going to watch yeah and then if you want to get that one other channel that you watch it's in a whole different bundle so that is why um, i love the the it's like netflix it's called shutter and it's just all horror movies all of them all horror movies it's old new horror movies new horror movies crazy horror movies and you know what you're getting. It's horror movies. I love it. That's the one thing that I'm super happy to be subscribed to. All right, let's, I know we got lots of questions for David, so let's totally move on. Um, that, that's another thing, Steam TV, steam.tv. Something showed up online and it was uh, like a live stream of a Dota tournament or something, I don't know, steam.tv. And it looked a lot like Twitch. Um, some people saw it and then it went away. And there's no information about it anywhere except for that it happened. So a lot of people are thinking that Steam is going to do something to compete with Twitch. I mean, and you know what? We were talking about something similar to that yesterday. Like it's on that platform already. They don't want you to leave their platform to go like on Twitch. You have to leave to go to Steam to purchase a game and then come back with Steam. You don't even have to leave your platform. You'll be just streaming. Oh, I want to buy a game. Bam. And it's right there. All right, oatmeal. I like we're the way that you know, they announced it, and then they were like, "Oh wait, they, they, we're, we're not ready for that." Yeah. And then, like two days later, they went, "Okay, now it's live." It's, but it's not live yet, is it? Yeah, I think it was live yesterday. Steam I think it's like TV. legitimately live now. Twitch um, TV. Twitch tried to do the opposite. You know, they started with the streaming and then tried to have the storefront, and I think that was a much harder path to go. You know, I think it's behooves valve you know already having as you said they already have the store all set up so it kind of makes sense to add that layer on top of it oh i see it's just it's just a dota the international dota 2 championship is what they're doing see and i think this is more of steam's lack of focus and them being reactionary instead of you know setting up setting up the precedent because they you know, hold so much market share in the industry anyway, I think they've just been able to sit it back on their laurels for too long. And now all this other stuff's going on and they're like, oh crap, we have to catch up. And I, I, you know, I also imagine if that, if that is also like a result of valve culture, because valve culture is more like, it's not like everybody had, okay, here's the projects we're working on people. And, and you work here and you work here. Valve culture is more like, here's we're in a big ass room. Everybody has desks on wheels. And if you want to work on a project or start a project, you just push your stuff over here with these people and say, hey, I'm going to work with you guys. And then and then work start working on a project. So, and then it's like, oh, well, I'm tired of working on this. I'm going to go work on that. And you go work somewhere else. I mean, that's... <laughs> Maybe that's why Half Life Three has been in production for twenty years or whatever. <laughs> half, half, half the team just left mid project. Yeah, they're like, I'm bored. Go work on something else. Yeah, no, see, and and that's just the way understanding I have of that. But that may or may not be accurate. It may just be my interpretation. They do better to work out a good Twitch integration. They'll never pull away enough users as Twitch does other platforms and also non gameplay streams. 
That's a good point. Good point, Tal or new. <laughs> and who's coming in from the 12 days of indie was that is that lolinia that's our that's the new uh twitch channel for the uh um we're, we're not sure we're gonna have it on there but i want to talk to you about that later about the uh charity event for toys for tots for november oh, but yay I, I told you a while back i wanted to do a charity thing too and you know it's just one of those things on my list so that'd be awesome okay uh all right news spam now we're at the top of the news all that other stuff was just fluff for, that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> PSA, key scam emails are still real. Use things like Keymailer and Woovit. Woovit? Jeez. I don't know what that is. No, actually, I work with Woovit. I live stream for Woovit, so that's pretty cool. And every time you say that, I just keep thinking of that lamer from Madagascar. I like to Woovit, Woovit. I know. Exactly. I know. That should totally be their icon. That's... Or their, you know... That's why, because I do that, and he's like, and and the CEO is like, you know, I think that too. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, the article. Sorry, I just got one of those pop ups that said you don't have us. You know, you have ad block on. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a breakdown for, and they're talking to an indie developer as well as uh, a woman who does. You know Emily Morganti, who does PR for you know games like Thimbleweed Park and West of Loathing, and they're talking about you know the different scam emails and how many they get, and you know it hasn't gone away. You know it's one of those things that you don't have any control over. If you're releasing something, you're going to get these emails. Yeah. You know it's another realization to you know use things like Keymailer or Woovit. I mean, what do you all use, David? I mean, how do you all deal with this or just ignore them? Well, I think no matter what you do, you always they'll always find their way through. So, you um, you're on Woovit though, aren't you? Yeah, we're we're on Woovit. Um, we we've been using Indie Boost a little bit, and but we we still get just tons of emails through even our website form. So, every time every time a new game you know shows up in the the coming soon for Steam Store or you know goes out on you know nintendo's you know new like upcoming games you get an thing. email like, saying hi i'm man versus game will you send me 100 <laughs> keys please some sometimes <laughs> sometimes it'll be you know five emails in a row that are just like change name change channel and you're like you use the same template and you send them one minute apart from each other like how <laughs> how do you think this is believable <laughs> it's so silly so the way well, that, I, what is, what's the way for you that content, cre like if I'm a content creator and I want to, I want you to, uh, you know, hey, can you hook me up with a game key? But I, uh, the easiest way for you to find out that I'm legitimate. I think the easiest way is just, you know, credentials, you know, as much as possible. I know, I know content creators will, you know, they'll put their contact email in their channel, in their YouTube channel or Twitch channel. Um, that's the easiest way. And then you just check to, match that you know when you get the email from them that's the that's the easiest way and isn't us, it I so think. annoying when content creators don't put their email anywhere that it's easy to find it's crazy how many companies in general make it so difficult to to contact them you're like yeah. that's, that's that's the point is we want to work with you and you know you have to like go down this like twitter rabbit hole to try to like get into their their inbox I, I tell content creators all the time they're like yeah but i don't want spam i'm like so make another email <laughs> <laughs> dummy i mean because i do influencer outreach as well and how many times i'm like okay i'll go to their twitter no nope, there's no email there oh there's no email on their twitch oh i'm not on youtube pass you know i really wanted to work with this guy but i can't contact him and i'm not gonna like do a twitch whisper or any of that stuff yeah, and would you it, just spent 10 minutes looking for their information. Would it be reasonable to provide 90 to 95% off coupons instead of key codes to content creators? Hi, Jesse. That's an interesting idea. My only concern is that you're still going to get content creators that are looking at it and they'll go, I've got an option of streaming two games. This one's going to cost me $2.99 and this one's going to cost me nothing. And they'll end up doing the one that costs them nothing. Right. I mean, what about just flat out saying on your website, the only codes we give out are through Keymailer and Woovit and IndieBoost and, you know, all these other sites like that. 
yeah, that could be a solution and then just ignore everything else, I guess. Needing to go through a payment process would deter a lot of a legitimate key requests. That's true, but as a content creator myself, honestly, I rarely ever have to buy a game. So it's like ingrained in me where I'm like, well, do I, am I gonna have to pay for this game? I'll just play something else, you know? You think there it'd be cool have. for Steam? Okay. Um, weird. We, I don't want to eat up all of this airtime for him. Okay, what do we got here? Props to a really old client. What is that? Starbreeze sets sales records in a quarter. Jay, what did I tell yes. you about drinking in the morning? I didn't drink yet. <laughs> oh, Most dog. likely, I was in a hurry. I copy pasted this. No, Starbreeze. No, no, I no, no. Get... I was saying because I heard your dog. Oh, no, that was, yeah, that she. <laughs> <laughs> she's out like a light um, that back in the day i think it was star breeze's first game or it might have been their second game you know i was the one that got their deal for that thing and it was just i always like seeing companies that i worked with 10 15 years ago frankly still be around in this industry so uh just a little shout out and congratulations to all those folks over there As a small content creator, you feel like the best way is to just buy the game, unless you have a huge audience that makes it worth giving you a game for free. Are you too modest? Um, I think even small content creators, you should sign up on Woovit. Even small, even, and I hate saying the word small content creator. Any size content creator should be able to, um, I, I feel, as a content creator, to be able to get so, some games for free. You know, I'm not small, I'm viewer challenged. Yeah, I just I just don't like the term small streamer. As well. How about growing, growing content creator? There you go. You there you go. Yes, because exactly. once you're like, oh, a small streamer, then you've like niched yourself into this mindset. Joke ignored. Yes. Uh, it's what happens when I give him a you know a stream at nine in the morning his time. <laughs> that's that's it's like you don't say you're poor, you say you're broke. You're in a temporary state that you're going to be getting out of or. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm currently I'm working towards wealth success. right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm currently working towards success. Uh, okay, what's the other one? Uh, analysts, more players are making um, in-app purchases with less nudging from marketers. Yeah, this I saw this this morning, and it is you know this is one of those news bite that is geared very much towards the free to pay, free to play publisher and developer. But it's interesting in that you're seeing we're seeing an uptick in purchase is you know in app purchases but it's taking less marketing to you know get that so they're saying you know 13.4 percent of mobile game players complete an in-app purchase and that's a 67 percent increase you know from last year and so if you're one of these indie devs that's sitting out there going oh we're gonna make a free-to-play you know game because that's what they all have to be pay attention to that only 13% of the people that download your game are going to buy it. It's brutal. Don't do it. Um, but, you know, the cost to acquire a free-to-play consumer last year was fifty, almost $51. And now it's down to $28. So, you know, for, for the one, small one, student, by one person? Yes. That's a cost, lot. Yeah, it is. That's why free to play doesn't make sense unless you're, you know, King or EA or somebody that can cross promote the game across a bunch of other games that they have. You know, it's going even at twenty eight dollars, it is going to cost you twenty eight, twenty nine dollars to even acquire that user. That means to make money on every single you know paying user you get, you're going to have to convince them to spend thirty bucks. You, you know what happened? Why it's it's now you, they need less of a marketing to get in-app purchases? Why One word, Fortnite. Telling you. That's true. Fortnite, <laughs> bam, blew up, and that's the whole everything. So now it's like so ingrained in people. That's just what you do. I mean, people have been doing in-app purchases for a while, but I mean, now it's just like, that's just what you do in Fortnite. You buy stuff every week. You buy something new. Oh, let's buy something this month. Let's buy something, you know, it's just... Mom, I want this. Mom, I want that. Um, well, I'm not saying all Fortnite players are kids, but I would guess that more than 50% <laughs> of them are. Um, but you know what I mean? I, I just think it's so ingrained now, and it's probably that's probably a big part of it. That's my opinion. Anyway, what about you? What do you think, way, David? 
I as a star Fortnite player. <laughs> well, I I think you're right. I think that uh, you know people have been taught that that's that's the way to do it. Now I think the way they monetize it makes a lot more sense anyway. It's you know they're making more money off of their battle pass than anything else, and that's a you know a win win for everybody around here. Yep. All right. Now we're going to so, get to the meat and potatoes of this, right? Let's let's give a little intro to David here. So David is the CEO of Occupy Games. If you are a regular listener, you hear us plug his little festival service like constantly to the point that it's a um, it's stickied in our Discord server. Nice. Um, little they, festival <laughs> service? That where you can go and sign up and they send you an email when you've got, you know, there's a conference submission coming up or there's an indie festival submission coming up. So you don't ever, you know, forget about all these things. There are so many of them around the world that, you know, that simple little service that, you know, Akapara offers, which is free, is completely awesome for um I don't want to call it a little festival service. How about a growing festival service? That's good. <laughs> good point. So, David. And I'm going to play Chicken Assassins, which is an Acapara game in the background. Gamer, what's up? Give us a little background into, you know, how you got into this industry. You know, what you've been doing over the years and, you know, the genesis of Acapara itself. So, I started off with uh, a studio called Nightlight Interactive that I started about six years ago and our first game was whispering willows so that was just all development you know kind of right out of college learning the ropes um creating a game from essentially nothing with a lot of my college buddies and found i i guess luck luck of the first game found you know moderate success with it ended up bringing it across you know we started off uh with the ouya and was kind of motivated by the Ouya's whole campaign. And that that's kind of re really what got me started. And then they were just a very supportive community, met a lot of really great indie developers from there, and then started, you know, bringing the title to other platforms as well. And, uh, you know, had a couple of publishers with Whispering Willows and just with early games that I worked on. And it went okay, uh, but definitely felt like there were things lacking and things that could be improved. And uh, ultimately, you know, I was inspired to later down the road a couple of years ago do it myself. And because I I identified a few things that I didn't really quite feel like were were being addressed enough with with publishers. And the the two main things that we like to focus on are passion which, um, you know, you, you always see that coming from like the development side, you always have that, that passion and excitement growing your project. But then, you know, working with these partners, these publishers, these marketing teams, we found that oftentimes they would not have the same passion. They would kind of just do the work um, without really kind of caring about it and investing in it. And the other thing was just kind of the creativity behind it and thinking outside the box and, um, you know, a lot of the campaigns that we had, a lot of the teams that we hired, they were doing very just vanilla, you know, to the books, same campaign for every single project. And we really wanted to see how we could push that more. How can we bring, you know, creativity to the marketing? How can we do, you know, kind of crazy marketing stunts and, you know, stuff that will get attention. And, you know, when we go to a convention, how do we, you know, even as like a small or let's say a growing uh, publisher, <laughs> how, how, how do we how do we bring more uh, more eyes, you know, to our space when we're competing with, you know, like at E three with, you know, large AAA studios. So that that's been kind of our main focus now. As, how, how do you as do those kind of like big promotions with like, because it's indie games, so it's a, there's a much lower budget. Yeah, definitely. It's. I think it's. It's getting creative for the smaller budget. It's um, for for E three um, for our upcoming game Desert Child. We we actually built an arcade machine 
Um, we, we, we took an old Virtua Tennis and then stripped it out and repainted it and, you know, printed it up new branding and it looks absolutely fantastic. And we, we brought that to E3 and we were in the Indicate space still. And we're, you know, past years, we had been just, you know, a computer monitor on a desk Mm -hmm. and, you know, we were still in a sea of computer monitors on desks because that's, that's what, what Indies felt like. That's all they could do. But our presentation was so different. much different and that it, it, you know, it, it really attracted a lot of people to it just purely in the presentation of it. And, uh, you know, it allowed four people to play at once. It allowed us to have a press side and a consumer side. It was just like big and bright and very loud, you know, two different speaker systems in it. Um, and so we we were really happy with it and it, you know, it cost us a couple thousand bucks um compared to you know you know we still just had the the indicade you know booth space and you know we we did the whole thing on probably a a three four thousand dollar budget so how long did it um, take you to come up with that idea i mean was there like a lot of brainstorming or was it just kind of like oh let's do this this will be awesome i i think the idea came pretty quick and then the effort (laughs) took a lot of time it was it was about three or four months on and off of just like on our weekends and our on our nights like Ah, oh, now we have to paint it. Now you know arcade machines take a lot of different skill sets. You know, you can have <laughs> right. woodworking. You have you know you have to do painting. You have to do graphic design. You have to do electrical. You have to know. You just have to. We ended up having you know metalworking. We had to get a bunch of different kinds of people to to work on it. But um, despite all of it, you know, and my how stressed I got at certain points, it was definitely <laughs> worth it. Uh, and it, it definitely made a, a huge impact and it was probably our strongest like convention showing yet. So that's kind of the mindset we like to go into, you know, especially with conventions when there's going to be tons of eyes, but even just, you know, when we're running a campaign in general, it's how can we get creative? How can we do something for maybe the same amount of effort, but, you know, take, take a chance on, you know, st- we, we still, you know, we'll do traditional press outreach. We'll still do influencer outreach. We'll still do kind of all the bread and butter, but then, you know, what's like 25% of our budget or 25% of our effort that we can put towards trying new things. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, but at least you have like some creative element to it. So, so, and, you know, speaking of being at these shows, you're going to be at PAX West next week, right? Yeah, we're going to be at PAX West next week. And actually, that's that's us trying something different as well. We're going to have our very first tabletop game. We're going to have a, a party card game called UFO Gogo. That's awesome. Is it a, like a super complex game or is it any kind of game anyone can pick up and play? You, you can be drunk and learn it for the first time and, well, that's like, <laughs> and you'll be all right. <laughs> that sounds like the kind of games i play because i i mean i've got some card games i got into that and i'm like this is way too much shit to remember man yeah I, I i hate learning a game for the first time and it's just you know 20 pages of rules and you're like okay it's going to take us two hours to learn this the first time now this this is within five minutes you're in you're playing you're having fun oh nice you're essentially you're you're every person is trying to host the biggest party in the galaxy and there are aliens throughout the galaxy that are coming to these different parties so you're trying to attract aliens to your party and then once you get an alien card they have a rule associated with them and so you have to follow their rule and so kind of as you get more aliens you're having to follow more rules and then you're trying to call out other people when they're messing up their rules so it's it's just a big game of you know a bunch of people doing a bunch of silly rules and trying to follow their own rules while trying to you know catch other people and when they mess up it's it ends up being a lot of fun nice is it kind of like flux yeah it, in a sense uh de- definitely took some inspiration from flux as well thanks so much for the host and so- thank you guys for the follows too i went uh we've been getting a couple follows here and there thank you so let's get into you know publishing 101 and i'll put the where is that link right here um, you know, I'll put a link to the article that that I saw and that you wrote, which was awesome, and you know, for, for, for folks to follow along. But you know, you've seen and you're aware of a lot of the same stuff that you know I'm aware of, just doing the business side of this industry for a long time, and how not all publishers are created equal. Some are better than others, and there's definitely 
more to working with a good publisher than you know they're just going to sell your game you know that there's a lot of, of little stuff that goes in there so aside from you know what we used to call just slapping your name on the box and putting it on the shelf you know aside from releasing it under steam or, or nintendo or xbox or whatever under your account what are some of the you know things that you have to do to be a, a again a good publisher that a lot of developers probably aren't aware of well you know i think first as an indie it's especially with like your first title it's very easy to fall into uh, the most common trap i'd say is falling into wanting to go with publishers that provide financials and i think that's the first thing when an indie thinks of you know what can a publisher do for me it's i need money and so i'm going to find a publisher to get give me the money but oftentimes that's not the right mentality as uh, as you know you almost kind of have to sell your soul sometimes especially depending on how far you are into it uh to, to get the money you have to give a lot more to be able to get the money um and there, there's really a lot of other services and we're finding like a lot of our, our partners that are working with us are actually you know they've released a couple games and they've gone through the process and they've you know seen kind of how some publishers will treat them and then that's you know what attracts them to wanting to work with someone that actually you know cares about their product and cares about their team um so from a publisher you know th there's a lot of different things that you know can be offered uh as i said kind of the, the bread and butter is you know press and marketing outreach and communications influencer outreach and communications um, but then it's you know stuff you might expect like you know working in the storefronts you know um basically partnerships so working with you know whether sony or valve or nintendo to get promotions to you know get the game at their events uh but then there's a lot of other things that people don't think about such as uh, getting the ratings for the game because that's that's an entire process that's actually been made a little bit easier recently but there's you know 10 different rating agencies across the world and so you know if you want the game in the americas or if you want the game in europe or if you want the game in korea there's different rating processes for each of those that you kind of have to go through and pay fees and stuff like that um you know it could be everything from creating helping you create you know trailers to uh you know there's a lot uh, to, to doing like the QA for it. Our, our team actually, we help with a lot of the, the development side of things as well. You know, since we do have a development background and we actively work on development, our team, you know, we'll, we'll actually help doing all the porting for the title uh, as well as, you know, if, if the developer needs, you know, game design assistance or they need you know, a senior artist to give them some tips on how to do something. We're able to kind of provide those resources as, you know, advisors for helping them. And that's um, good too, to give that's, feedback. Yeah, that is awesome. You know, because it's like when you're working on your own game, you're so inside of that game. You don't know if it's good or bad or what. Yeah, totally. And you, 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 you know, one of the most common things I see is the game is just super, super hard sometimes because for the developers they've they've like mastered it and they're super good at it and they're like oh this is easy and then they show it to other people for the first time and people are like or you know what do i do i'm super confused how do i play this game or it's just i understand but it's really really hard <laughs> right and that and that definitely weighs into the you know we don't talk about it a lot with indie teams but you know what you're doing when you're showing it to those early people is your focus testing and you know you don't necessarily absolutely have to have a big focus testing you know set up and program but it is something that you need to be doing you know in some way shape or form to get an understanding for it and so you know that's a good point about you know the localization because you're not only dealing with uh you know just like translation but in some sense like in germany and china in particular you also have to you know take culture and you know given rules you know into effect there you know like you can't have uh like dead bodies or skeletons or things like that in games for china you can't have well actually i think they just changed it so that you can have 
Nazi symbols in yeah, they did Germany just that. now again. But I mean, it, there are different rules. And so, you know, diving into that just a little bit, David, when you're doing, and let's look at Germany in particular, if you're launching a game in Germany, do you need to have the USK rating as well as the PEGI rating? Or does the PEGI rating cover the USK rating? For Germany, it's it's interesting. It's uh, The PEGI rating will cover it to an extent. Uh, the Germany rating actually, they'll, they'll slap on basically like an 18 or older rating for your game unless you go through the USK. So if your game is high rated and you don't care, uh, then, then you you don't have to pay anything extra. But for instance, if if you have like an E-rated game and you want kids to be able to find your game in the store and not have like this like age gate restriction, then you should go through the the, the USK rating process as well. So, so the, so it's it's a it's a tax on people that aren't making violent games. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That or you makes just, you just make only, only violent games and then you're fine. <laughs> that, that is exactly the opposite of the way that you would think it would be. <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, those are, are different sort of things, but it is good. All right, so going back to the advisor part and, you know, like welcome to the show and, and how we do tangents and go off on multi like threads here. That is something that I can't, speak highly enough of because you know yeah it is like both you said you get so pigeonholed into your game and it's like oh well yeah of course i knew to like run right at the first level that's what we always do but you know people that aren't you know as involved in it you know may not have that same understanding and, and the fact that you've got you know folks that you can help advise along the way with things like art or code or you know resources that you can internally as a developer you know, put on to help these teams is, you know, that's fantastic. And, and it's not something that a lot of companies do. And, and in addition to just the advising, you know, I think it's also very helpful. A good publisher will help take the game to lots of events, uh, will help take it. You know, we even have taken games to like classrooms uh, of, you know, college game design students or high school game design students, just putting it in front of a lot of faces. Um, and especially being, a, you know, being a developer, I remember being at my very first convention and seeing people play the game. That's the best way to learn. That's the best way, you know, just hundreds of people over the course of a couple of days playing your game. Like, where do 75% of them fail at? You know, what are, you know, what are people getting confused and, you know, uh, it's, it's really invaluable. The, um, all right, so we got questions here <laughs> relating to Nazis. Um, Cameron was talking so, about the Southern flag. Well, yeah, steam, it's... steam is the one that got rid of the, of the rebel flag. That wasn't a, in Germany showing anything of Nazi, symbolism anything you know the the salute whatever that was a national law it wasn't even a game law i mean it was something that you couldn't do per the german government um apple removed the Confederate flag from games yeah the, the when apple when all the when all the you know, southern flags got removed from the games that was all platform specific that wasn't you know coming down from from washington dc um, and, and it's not really a, just a, it doesn't mean the southern United States that flag. No, it doesn't. It, it, that's a whole as someone who's grown up in the south, that's a whole different tangent of yeah. why I'm not a fan of that flag. Um, anyway, so when you're doing you know distribution, what do you think? I mean, where do you see the most bang for your buck in terms of you know PC stores that you need to be on? And then the follow-up to that is what are you what do you think about Discord's new announcement? So still Steam is d despite, you know, some of the the decisions they've made, Steam is still the biggest by far. They are, I don't know, 80%, if I were to guess, of the sales for a lot of our games, for for our PC uh titles. Um, maybe even more, maybe even closer to like 85 or 90%. The, the second one that, that 
it's a little bit actually probably the most difficult PC store to get on is GOG, and really they they yeah. they, they really have kind of a a curated kind of game that they want. You know, they're looking for strategy games, RPG games. They 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 know their audience and they want games that really appeal to that kind of audience. So <laughs> we've actually had a few games rejected from GOG. Uh, but GOG, the audience that they have knows that they're getting kind of this curated service. And so they they are very active in terms of buying and the games that we do have on GOG sell very, very well. Um, you know, also they, they want like DRM free games and stuff like that. And then I would say the third right now is, is Humble. Um, Humble does, you know, their, their store their their store is third their their bundles are actually even better they're they're the best spot for any kind of bundles um you know by like 10 times you know bigger than any other bundle that we've been on and making money from so those those are kind of the big three right now so where do you think discord's going to fall in that i i think definitely discord's going to be able to compete with it i think you know we use discord all the time already it's kind of become for a lot of indie developers and i see it more and more every day people starting their own discords it's the hub for all of your your community and the gamers that are with you it's like a, a, a new forums yeah i mean we we use we use discord for everything We're, we now point all of our channels to discord as kind of our our main our main hub we even have in games saying you know check out our discord so i think by having all of your audience already there and already by you know by being able to see what your friends are playing you know oh wow 20 people in this are playing you know whispering willows or chicken assassin then being able to just click it and buy it instantly from there i think is going to be really powerful so um you know steam is great, but I don't necessarily hang out in Steam. You know, I I don't feel like I'm part of any communities in Steam. You know, there are communities, but they they're a bit disconnected. And one thing that I'm glad that Steam did is they finally have like publisher and developer pages where you can have all your games kind of collated together and it's designed a little bit. But they still don't have you know Occupy Games is forum or group or community it's it's all on an individual game basis and that actually really kind of helps or sorry that that hinders a growing brand because you know we have all these separate you know kind of discussions going on across our different games but they're not brought together and so with something like discord it's able to kind of bring together all those chats to a single place for all of our games you know and that's a huge part. And I think that's why we've seen, you know, Discord pick up the traction that it has even before they said, okay, now we're going to start selling games because, you know, there isn't a easy to find. I mean, you've, for, for decades, we've had developers and publishers that had a forum on their website where people could go and talk and discuss. But, you know, having something like Discord, you know, has been able to bring it together in a much more you know, real time. And you do feel like you're a, a com in the community when you're talking about this stuff. So, I mean, I agree. That's one of the big things that they brought to it. And it's going to be interesting to see how they parlay that into, into a store. So, um, strep, is it strep foxes? How about itch? I know the audience is there is pretty specific, but is there any value to be being on itchio? Itch, I, I would say itch and game jolt kind of fall into a different category because um i think they're both great places just easy to get your game up um easy just to you know like the the lowest barrier of entry uh, they unfortunately don't you know not a ton of sales but i know like in particular like game jolt is really pushing their communities and pushing like the devlogs and you know to try to build it up there so you know I, I think itch is kind of trying to do the same thing they're trying to you know form it around the communities and form it around the the blogs i 
you know, ultimately, I think they're seeing that's that's again where Steam might be struggling a little bit more is is having those communities and that open communication, you know, with the developers themselves. So Oatmeal's got a question. Says, we, right now we've got three main places that we need to go. Twitch for streaming, Steam for games, you know, in terms of like the storefront and then Discord for connection. Who do you think will take over, you know, the other's role? How are we going to see that coalesce? Oh, man. I don't know. I, I definitely think they they will all come together as a single, you know, premier service eventually. Uh, I can't say because I think each one does what they do very well, which is why they're at the top in kind of that area. Um, so I, I don't know. I honestly have no idea. I'll, I'll throw my um, unpopular opinion out there and it's a long shot. I'll bet I'll put my money on the fact of Amazon ends up buying Discord. Well, they do have a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, 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 it's the same as when they got in on Twitch. They knew they needed to be in an area, and so you know, that's what they end up doing. But I think if it's not Amazon, someone is going to end up purchasing Discord in the next year. I would – I'm fairly – I'm going to lay my bet out there on, on that one. Um and I completely just lost my train of thought. Anyway, all right. So, if if I can cut in really quick, yes, Andy, please do. <laughs> Andy, you're uh, you're struggling a little bit with some of these enemies because you're not equipping any gear in Chicken Assassin. So, if you go back to your inventory, you have a couple items that can be equipped, which are going to increase your stats, and that that'll probably help you out a little bit. Um, okay. Oh, you got to click equip. That's my. I see. Yep. Now, you, now you'll get. You get some new weapons. I thought they just some, automatically some, equip. Some but. some some items sell. Other ones that you'll you actually have gear, so that should help you out a little bit. Okay, like the one that says, uh, "Use this to to work out to get stronger." But uh, or, or and then there was one that was a potion. Yes, some of them like are this just, one right here. Make these and like so that doesn't even do anything. I'll just no, nah, that's that's just money. I just thought that like the cops that would come in, they would not want to not hit me as much or something. No, but now now your stats should be increased a little bit and that should make things a little bit easier for you. Sweet. Thanks. So, David, let's talk about IP for a second. And I know that, you know, your stance and, and frankly the same advice I would give as well is unless there's a ton of money on the table, don't as a developer don't sell your ip when you're you're working with a publisher um yeah. talk a little bit about that and then you know the follow-on is you know as you're growing your publishing operation are you looking at outside ip to apply to games you know going out and getting a license to do a you know simpsons version or, or something along those lines have you thought about that where what do you think what are your thoughts on you know making moves like that with upcoming titles I'll, I'll start with your your first question in terms of just you know getting ip in general um i i think for for indies you know I, ip is definitely super valuable uh and in the past it was important but now i feel like in the last year i've been approached by many places uh especially being like in la and you know that that are wanting to find game ip game ip is kind of becoming like the hot new untapped market you know it was comic books a little bit before and now it's it's like what what awesome game ip can we target for you know tv shows for movies for you know a web series for anything like that and so you know we're actually in talks for several of our games and games you know we're we're representing uh we've we've started the conversations for them for you know getting merch deals or you know tv show deals or stuff like that so i think being able to have all those cards still in your hand is very important and uh, you know don't don't just give it up to the publisher just because you know make sure that there's like a very good reason because you know once 
once you pass on those rights, you know, they're going to be the ones that are going to be making, you know, all the money off of, of off of, you know, the, the various outlets that can take it. I still think as a publisher, it's good to help, you know, make those connections for the developers working with you so that they have as many opportunities as they can. And, you know, ultimately, like if the developer and the game is is getting on more places, that's just going to help the video game sales as well. Um, then in, in terms of working with outside IP, I we've done it a little bit. Generally, it's been in more of like a work for hire situation where they're just paying us to create the game for them. I think, you know, definitely as an indie, one of the hardest things is getting exposure. And so by working with an outside IP, you're automatically associating yourself with a brand that, uh, you know, is well known that has an audience. It, it saves a little bit of the leg room in terms of you having to kind of establish that stuff yourself. The the one unfortunate part is a lot of the times those places, you know, uh, those those larger entertainment studios that you know might be licensing the IP, they they charge you to work with the IP, or they want extremely huge you know revenue from it, and it's or you know sometimes you know they'll, they'll want a free to play mobile game for their ip but then they don't provide the proper support that you know and as an indie you're having to now support like this massive free to play simpsons game you know doing all the live ops you know covering sometimes even like the server costs and stuff like that and they essentially will like put the risk on you so i would say it can be great but three out of four times I've seen it's uh, it's you know it seems like it's great because they try to lure you in with these like great brands but then it's would actually if you if you look at it, it would be very hard to make it a feasible um, you know path for your team just a lot of the time because of finances honestly so I'm gonna follow because you're dead right and you actually took that in a direction that I didn't expect but I want to talk about as well but real quick all right, we've got four copies of games to give away, folks. So if you want to get in on that, do exclamation mark raffle. Um, and then, you know, the standard plug of, you know, if you like what we're doing here, don't forget to follow us and tell your friends. The We've definitely, and, and I've been working with IP for 20 years. And so going back to, you know, Douglas Adams' work on games that we did way back in the 90s, there has absolutely been a change. And I think one of the biggest triggers was when THQ went under. You know, THQ was known for, they're the ones that did all of these kids games. I mean, there's just a ton of licensed, you know, content. Even did uh, a SeaWorld title. At that point, a lot of developers and publishers started saying, you know what? I'm not going to give you a million dollars just to use your name on my game anymore. We need to start rethink this. And it started this conversion to, you know, the point where we are now, where not only, you know, do developers and publishers alike need to look at IP as a joint effort. I mean, there's a absolutely strong case for saying, you know, no money needs to change hands at all up front. You know, if, if it's a good partnership and everybody's doing their job, both the game and the IP are, you know, supporting one another. Yep. But then we've also seen, you know, somebody mentioned Angry Birds. Was Angry Birds the first one that just, you know, licensed the living crap out of it? Or, you know, <laughs> they're the ones that got everybody else looking for it. And now you're seeing things, you know, like you said, with merchandise and, you know, TV shows and options and all of this, you know, coming to, you know, developers. I mean, you've got Epic out there who's represented by William Morris when it comes to, you know, different IPs and things. I mean, different ways of licensing Fortnite into the rest of the world. I mean, you know, the, the Angry Birds model was fantastic because you could get anything from a a t-shirt to you know sheets to your bed and toothbrushes and everything had angry birds on it but you know you need to 
as the the game creator, whether that's the developer or the publisher, you absolutely have to look at these IPs, you know, in terms of are you going to support me? You know, just like you said, you know, and that's always one of the first questions that we have to, you know, licensors when they come to us and say, hey, we want to, you know, work with this game. I'm like, okay, so what are you going to do to promote it? Or, you know, if it's a game that wants to use their IP, the same question, you know, still exists. If, and I had a guy come to us like a year ago and said, all right, you know, we're going to do this and we want to sell the right. We have the IP to like some 80s action movies and I'm not going to you know, go into who it was, but I said, okay, he said he wants a quarter million dollars up front from a game company. And I said, so what are you going to do to support the game? And he goes, oh, we're, we're not going to do anything. You know, the, the name speaks for itself. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it doesn't. And, that, and, and that, that's where you shut the door and say, no, thank you. Yes, you know, exactly. That, that, that kind of mentality is just not good at all to go into a partnership with. It should be, you know, the game developer is going to create, you know, the, there's not a lot of great, you know, movie and TV show games. And so finding a great developer who's going to actually take this and make a quality product and make something that people are going to enjoy and want to see more of, you know, that there they need to see the value in the developer as well as the, you know, the developer obviously sees the value in the brand, but. So, yeah. And, and so, you know, again, I, I'll give you props for the fact that, you know, you go, you all work with these developers and, you know, don't just come in and say, okay, we're publishing the games. We have the IP. And if we ink a t-shirt deal, then, you know, that's all for us and, and, and none for you. Um, you know, and this, you know, that's one of the ways that we can talk about, you know, cross marketing as well. And, you know, you bring up in your article distribution, not necessarily distribution, but I'll call it peripherals, you know, where, you know, NVIDIA may have a special promo to get your game included on, you know, the new version of the Shield or Logitech may be doing something with one of their, their keyboards or mice. Talk a little bit about you know, the value of doing that for one, and then how you all look at each opportunity and see if it's, it's a good fit for, you know, the company and the game to go and pursue that. Yeah. Um, one of the main things I focus on on the company is is partnerships. And that's not only with distributors, but as you said, with, with like Logitech, with NVIDIA, with, you know, hardware partnerships, software partnerships, you know, Unity, game maker you know whoever whoever promotes games you know i like to have strong relationships with because uh, you know a lot of the times these companies even even nintendo sony you know um they all have their their marketing agendas the stuff that they want to see from the game uh or the stuff that they want to see from the company that they want to be successful and you know whether it's like nvidia is pushing as you said like the the latest graphics card or logitech has a new speaker system that lights up um that's or nintendo you know they're they're pushing hd rumble right now and so it really behooves you know indies and publishers to to try to cater to those aspects because that's what they're going to want to promote on their site that's what they're going to want to promote in the nintendo store you know they why would they promote a game on the Nintendo store that doesn't take advantage of any of the Nintendo hardware. But if you can take advantage of HD rumble and you can take care, you know, advantage of, uh, you know, being able to play the switch on the go, then that's stuff that they're going to want to talk about in their, their commercials and their, you know, uh, in their press releases and, you know, stuff like that. So I always look for the opportunities um, with, with the partnerships. I always, you know, when I go into a meeting, especially for the first time, but even, you know, every year at GDC, I meet with every partner that we have. And one of my first questions is, what are you looking for right now? Right? Because they have so many people that want them just to do stuff for them. But if you can, if you can cater to what they're looking for, then they're going to be much more inclined to help you. So it's what, you know, my first question is, what are you looking for? The next question is, what can you do for me? and uh or what is your company doing to promote games right now and then between those two things you know we start formulating our plans and that's usually the you know when we're 
making a, a strategy for how to pitch to Nintendo, we're we're addressing each of the things that they're wanting first, uh, because that's that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. So my burning question is, what is HD Rumble? So the Switch has the most advanced Rumble out of like any controller um, in the in the Joy Cons and. Uh, it actually allows you to, you know, standard controllers just essentially shake. It's shake hard or shake soft and or some degree in the middle, um, you know, a dial one to ten. But with the switch, you can actually feel stuff like a marble rolling around. And it feels like you can actually feel the weight of the marble going back and forth and coming towards you and going away from you. You can feel stuff like water it feels like there's water inside the controller because it's like a bunch of little vibrations all around oh, it. Wow. Um, it's Seriously, really... what game is this in? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's part of it. Like, you know, so for, for Whispering Willows, uh, we're going to be doing an upcoming Switch launch and we're, oh. we integrated HD Rumble in the game. And so it's when you're around good ghosts, it's going to vibrate differently than when you're around bad ghosts. And as you get closer to the ghosts, it's going to be more intense, but we have different, different patterns of vibration for different kinds of elements in the game. And it's that kind of thing that I think really excites them. It's, you know, you got to use their technology and you got to, you know, create the coolest thing you can with it. There's another game I saw that, you know, the whole game was about rolling around. And so, (laughs) you know, tilting back and forth. And so, that was perfect for HD Rumble because uh, the whole game is basically taking advantage of the HD Rumble. So is, is it All like right. a, a new custom controller or is it just the standard? It's it's the Joy Cons basically. So it's their standard controllers. Yeah, but then All I right. think the I think the Pro controller has the HD Rumble in it also. All right. So Andy, can you get a press release that you know we just had our very first exclusive news <laughs> announcement before anybody else in the whole world you know here on the show because. Exclusive I knew news. about I knew about Whispering Willows. We, we, like, we haven't like announced the, it yet. Don't say anything. No, I'm like, okay. I, 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 I wanted I, hipsters. I wanted to give you guys the anecdote, even <laughs> though it spoiled the news. So, no, 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 no one say anything yet. We'll be announcing in a couple of weeks. <laughs> we're we're gonna break this wide open. You know, um, it does. So you know, along those lines, real quickly, you know, that's awesome. Congrats and. But they didn't include you on their announcement the other day. Was that? Are they gonna? Was there a specific reason for it? Or we you... we just we haven't even fully communicated it to Nintendo yet. So that'll okay. be we're gonna be working on their marketing team probably this week. So awesome. And so you know what you're talking about is something that folks a lot of companies don't realize, and it's been going on for years. I mean, even years ago with iTunes, and you know everybody's like, how do I get featured? The easiest way to get featured on iTunes, you know, and it's still true, is to be supporting something that they haven't launched yet, which, you know, puts you in the catch-22 of, well, I don't work with them very closely. How do I know what they're going to launch? Well, you know, welcome to the industry. But, you know, the companies that were supporting like Retina before it launched were the ones that were featured at the big, you know, Apple conference and and all the news and, and all that kind of good stuff. So, you know, it does go back to partnership building, which goes back into your biz dev and, and all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, like you said, David, I mean, that's a, that's what you do. That is your job. And, you know, with our consulting firm, that's my job is to constantly be out there, you know, talking to people, understanding what's important, you know, whether they're a publisher or a developer or a service provider and, you know, thinking through, how to best help them with that solution, you know, because, you know, even as a developer going to a publisher, I love, you know, what you said there, you know, if you're shopping it, talk, ask the publisher, what are you looking for right now? You know, it may not be their game, but it may be, they may be in the hunt for something that you've been thinking about doing in the background anyway, totally. and you can get a, a good partnership out of that. So, yeah, I mean, that's like super, super good advice. Um, I mean, that kind of advice goes a lot good with like sponsors as well. You know, you're reaching out to maybe you want to sponsor for whatever. I'm talking about live streamers that you want to sponsor. Um, instead of just saying, what can you do for me? You approach them as like, here's what I can do for you. 
you know, I really like your product or whatever. Here's what I can do for you. Then how can you help me out? It's it's really you want them to know that you can do something for them first. And that goes uh, uh, along the lines of a lot of different things. Yeah, T totally. And a lot of the times it's, you know, implementing. You, you don't have to make always your entire game revolving around this particular feature. A lot of the times it's fairly low hanging fruit in terms of how you could provide something for them and then in turn you you really do get some major promotional like logitech we we work very closely with logitech and logitech sponsored half the parts in the arcade machine that we made for desert child and in turn we made a lot of the you know we use their their speakers which lit up we used you know we we promoted them by putting their logo you know front and center on the machine itself and so you know by us doing just those you know few small things it allowed us to get a couple thousand dollars worth of hardware so uh really incredible sometimes you know what you can accomplish just by you know how do you cut through the crowd you know if, if everyone's asking for stuff and so it's hey i'm gonna ask for stuff but i'm also gonna do something in return for you right. and it really it really makes an impact logitech is an easy company to work with though for sure yeah they're, they're fantastic super helpful and, and, it, and it really is. And a lot of people don't realize how little it takes. I mean, I remember back in the day we were going to E3 and I can't remember if it was Logitech or Thrustmaster. Is Thrustmaster even still around? Anyway, one of them sent this form to all of the, you know, exhibitors at E3 and they're like, Hey, if you'll put a little sign, and it was like a little thing like you'd see at a restaurant, just a folded piece of plastic that said, you know, provided by whoever it was. And they were like, check the list on what you need for your show. Well, I mean, I checked every single box on there because I'm like, there's no, way this is, there's no way this is legitimate. And, you know, sure enough, we got to the show and there were these giant boxes of steering wheels and joysticks and all this stuff that was there. These companies you know they need games that support them as well and so that's one of the best kinds of relationships you can get in giving you speakers or controllers or you know video cards or whatever is that's a low cost barrier to the company and in turn you know if you're just simply you know putting a sign out at your you know booth at, at PAX or putting a splash screen in your game that said, you know, this is specially formulated or whatever to run best. What do they usually say? This game runs best on right. video or whatever. That's not, you know, complicated. You know, that's not really hard. Right. You're not having to go do a lot of work and it, it works out very, very well. So, yeah, we, we even, we even take it to, you know, uh, partnerships with other indie developers and, you know, each indie developer, has their own communities forming but when you can cross promote between other indie developers then you can help like there's no reason th there's not you know uh, so few games that like you know you, or you're you, you, a developer's not creating so many games that they need to like control the entire market like there's a <laughs> there's enough to share the audiences right and when you can kind of hey let's put this character from our IP into your game and put a character from your game into, you know, our, our game, it makes the audiences interested in purchasing those other titles. And it, it really helps kind of spread, spread the communities up. And so I, I really like that about indie developers in general. It's just that they've always been super willing to like, let's help each other out. It's, it's, you know, it's not the, you know, I've heard horror stories from like, you know, actors in LA that, you know, everyone's always trying to backstab each other and trying to like make their way to the top of the the Hollywood like food chain. But with indie developers, it's it's all about like working together and, and doing things as a team. So I I really respect that. Hey, hey, thank you for the sub. Woo! Yes, exactly. And and we had nice um, Heather from Fail Better Games on was it last week or two weeks ago talking about you know exactly that. You know, they did their Love Indies campaign not only to promote their upcoming games, but to try to get a bit of a movement behind, you know, everything and, and have teams cross promoting each other, because it is, I mean, it's, we're not in a situation where 
you know, if you're making an adventure game, you have to like, you know, start guarding your corner and going, we got to knock out all the competitors to our adventure game. The industry's massive. You know? Yeah. And, and so, people are going to buy more than one game. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. So yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's awesome. So, you know, we're getting here towards the end. So folks, if you haven't entered the raffle yet, do exclamation mark raffle. We're giving away some games. Um, Taller Follow us. Just, tell your friends. Taller nude just sub. Sub hype. The, Thanks for the sub, dude. Taller new. Awesome. Taller. Taller. I don't know how to say that. Taller. We're just call, just call him T. T. Tau. Uh, Tau. We've got you know, and this is part you know where I'm supposed to be managing this, and and I suck at it. Remember we were talking about this, David. Uh, we've got our Discord, Twitter, all of that stuff is you know down below us. Uh, if you refresh, I actually did get rid of the um, promo that we were running last week because I completely forgot to before the show. Um, but also, we posted uh, David's Discord for their server, uh, and we've got a lot of their social media that I can throw out there as well. Uh, the most, you know, helpful one by all means is that one with their festival system that we talked about earlier. Um, but we'll put the rest of their, uh, the rest of their information in there as well. If you've got questions, throw them up a chat, you know, we'll absolutely get to them. I got so, it. It's taller than you. Cause he's six foot eight. He is taller than me. Oh, <laughs> taller than you. That makes sense. The, the festival thing was actually kind of goes along with what we we're just talking about in terms of looking for opportunities. Um, I had used promoter app for, for years for, uh, a bunch of things, you know, tracking, they had a, a way to track press from around the, the web, but also they had this promoter calendar, which basically is what our festivals calendar is and heard they're shutting down and said, you know, reached out to the guy immediately and said, Hey, can we take this over from you? Would you point the existing people that are, you know, going to yours to ours as like the new place? And it was great. And within like two days of it shutting down, we had our version up and we even added a couple more bells and whistles on top. But, you know, I think, I think it's just, just like in game development where you're always keeping an open mind and always looking for opportunities for like, you know, how do I create something awesome? It's the same thing when you're doing business. And I, I take the same approach with marketing, the same approach with, with business relations. It's, it's looking, f it's, you know, being creative, it's looking for opportunities. It's, you know, helping out other people. Um, so yeah, I, and it's, it's been great. We, we love having that. And it's, you know, it's one of our team members a few hours a week and to upkeep it, but because of us having that, it's actually helped bring in, you know, a lot of traffic to our website and a lot of interest to our products. So it's been a yeah, great. Uh, as, as a confession, I used to keep track of that internally here and I've stopped doing this because I just <laughs> said, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, we got this, we got this thing coming up now. because it is, there's so much going on that it, it is hard to keep track of it. But yeah, we actually, the reason we endorse it is because I use it. That's um, great. Thank you. All right, so Lacey, yeah, thank you for the of, host. 12 Days of Indy wants to know if they can play Chicken Assassin during 12 Days of Indy. So, sure. Indy, can you tell me what that is real quick? Sure. Huh? What What is 12 Days of Indy? 12 Days of Indy is, uh, this will be the, what, sixth year, Lolinia, that we put it on? Lacey it was actually part of it last year. Hey, Lacey. Um, Six year. Yeah. Uh, it's a 12 day long marathon on my channel on twitch.tv slash indie where we raise money and awareness for toys for tots. That's awesome. So, we're so I mean, in. not to put you on the spot or anything, David, but you know, they want to play this when that, when, um, yeah, By yeah all to go. I mean, we're always looking for sponsors for it. And so that would be awesome to have uh, Acapura and, uh, indie game business as sponsors. I don't know, man. I don't have to let you talk to my agent. There's some pretty hefty fees for working with us. You uh -huh. know, we've got such a, <laughs> such a huge following and we're so influential. Um, but no, yes, of course, you know, I'm in. That, that's, yeah. a, that's a given. Um, wow. Last thought. I mean, what? So here's always a good one. 50 for, page uh, contract. <laughs> GTFO. 40, 49. It's not 50. We got rid of one of the page breaks. <laughs> 
The um, what is your recommendation in terms of how developers need to, you know, present their game to you? And so, so let's let's flip this around and say, what are you looking for right now? You know, are you looking for new games? You know, what's the big thing that you're that you're in search of? And then how do you think, I mean, how do you recommend developers, you know, reach out to you? <laughs> Did we lose David? Yeah, he's frozen. We lost David. It reminds me of the, uh, the Mark Zuckerberg Facebook robot thing. The what? Mark Mark Zuckerberg face like when he was getting interviewed and he kept drinking water and he just had that he's frozen look. Yeah, David's gone. <laughs> we might have to hang up and then come back. Let me pause this. Oh, I can't pause. No, I can't pause. Now you're dead. <laughs> now I'm dead. I can leave. That's okay. Let's go to. Of course, something doesn't work. There we go. Let's see here. Uh, Pardon us when we have technical interruption. Yeah. So is there is anyone else out there? And I'll tell you what we'll do in the meantime. I'll give away some of these games. Okay. That's a, that's a good thing to do. Not a bad free stream as they go. I know it could have been like. Yeah, let's give away some games. It looks like he is um, gone. Taller new. Taller new. You, taller new. <laughs> Yeah, it's because he's taller than you. I'd be able to pronounce that. Taller than you. All right, so we're going to give you a choice. We've got four keys. What do we have keys for? We have keys for Chicken Assassin. And we have keys (laughs) for Whispering Willows as well. So, (laughs) taller than you. (laughs) Which one would you you rather have? Did I, like, zoom in right there? (laughs) No. (laughs) It's fine. It's all right. Sorry, you know me. I can't sit still when I do this stuff. Um, Taller than you, send me a note or put it in chat. Which one do you want? You can either have Chicken Assassin or... um... I have control. Do not adjust your television, your monitor. Actually, Uh, I don't even know. I I can't even see what we're doing. All right, so you're going to get Whispering Willow. I have to write this down. Oh, gosh. Let's see. Let's, Let's fix this. Let me send this. See, again, you know, people put me in charge of stuff, and this is what happens. All right, so we're going to do three more drawings. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely. If y'all have questions along the way, absolutely let me know. All right, pick another winner. Wait, I, see, Animated is, break. I am the absolute business. This is abs- – and, uh, and all right. I don't know how to do this, you know, to, to get um, another. Just, this, is, this is Andy. I don't know. I, I don't have know. It's, it's, All right. So we're going to, we're going to do it this way. You have to reset um, it and then just do it again. You can just whisper the person right now. There should be a button that you press and then whisper them. And then you can All right, send them the be- thing. Because actually this Rich. is going to be really easy. So. Um, Gamer Husband's already got one, so 12 days of indie, <laughs> you're going to win one. The someone next is going to win one, and Scary Robot wins one. Yeah. There we go. I'll do it with a random thing on my end. All right, so if I just called your name, whisper me with your choice. There's one more uh, Whispering Willows available. There's two more. There's still two Chicken Assassins. Uh-oh, you're giving him a choice? Never well, give them a choice. Otherwise, never otherwise give them I'll a have choice. to like, think about it. So, you know, <laughs> never I don't do thinking. And just decide for them. Never ever okay. give them. No, I'm just so messing with you. What, oh. Speak up if you want the other Whispering Willows, and then I'll get the Chicken Assassin and the other two. All right. So what else have we got going on? And, and we'll, you know, follow up <laughs> with, with David later. Hopefully, you know, he's still okay and nothing crazy went down over there. Internet went out and all that kind of good stuff. All right. Um, all right. So are we going to, Andy, what do you think? Are we going to move our Friday show to that other place or are we going to wait or what are we going to do? I mean, I really don't see a reason to, I mean, we could try it. 
but I, I kind of don't, I don't know. You, you kind of don't you put me on the spot there. Um, I know. Well, I mean, why go to Mixer? I mean, I like being over here. We, I mean, we can, we can try a show over there on Mixer. I was, I was going to give it a try. Okay. Mixer has more viewers. Fortnite's five month iOS revenue on par with Clash Royale. Crazy. That's just news that yeah. just came across. Facebook oh. There. Wait. You back, David? I'm back. And we're back. Yay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. My internet cut out. Had to reset everything. That's okay. That's all right. We're, we're poorly giving out games over here. Um, awesome. <laughs> And I'm gonna to have to bug you for another Whispering Willows. Yeah, of course. Key because it says that one was taken. Or one of the ones that you sent me was taken already. Let uh, me grab that right now. All right. So, what question were we on? The oh, how how should what should developers have ready when they go to a publisher and pitch? What do you want to see? You know, when they're showing you a game, and then the bigger one is. What are you looking for right now? So the the best thing for us is uh, three things. A pitch deck, which essentially outlines what the game is. So I can just, you know, quickly read through, understand the game, understand more importantly where they're taking the game and what they want to do with the game, uh, as well as, you know, outlining the what do they need? Do they need money? Do they need just marketing support? Are they looking for really you know the guidance of a team are they looking for porting uh a, a trailer ideally of the game again just to be able to <clears throat> quickly in a few minutes see what they have you know uh see if it's something that's interesting and then the third thing is a build of the game and that's that's to see how it feels it, you know with at least it, a vertical slice right something like exactly that. with it with at least a vertical slice to to get you know even five ten minutes of gameplay is fine as long as it represents you know where the game's gonna be going uh because a lot of the times you know something may look nice but it it doesn't feel right so those those three things i think are the most important to to have when when coming to us and you know i i don't need a whole essay when someone's writing you know just That's a what few I was gonna sentences ask. a few sentences on who they are you know, here's my pitch deck. Here's my video. Here's my build. That's perfect. And oh, then, a vertical, you know, a vertical slice means pretty much done. That doesn't necessarily mean pretty much done. Well, I mean, you know, it's a certain area, a specific specific part of the game, or a certain amount of the game, like a whole entire level that's done. I mean, it doesn't have to be 100 percent done, but you don't want yeah, to have but, a but bunch of the, placeholder the, stuff in at there. At the 80, 90 percent mark, yeah. basically. And that's why I was going to ask about the pitch deck. Do you want like for the initial pitch deck? Do you want like something that is a fifteen page in super detailed, or do you just want like a three, four, five page, you know, spreadsheet that has not spreadsheet but um, doc that has you know some graphics and pictures and that kind of stuff? I'm I'm all about efficiency. So uh, for me, you know, if it can be more concise, then you know that that's even better. But if it was long and it's but i can still get through it quickly you know like a bunch of pictures and stuff is fine so you don't if want to hold no if it's 20 20 pages of reading you know i'm not going to do that you know okay. even even as a, a a growing publisher we we have a lot of a lot of people that submit games to us each week and i can only imagine you know some of the the larger more established you know publishers have just I'm sure they get flooded like hundreds a week. So, you know, it's almost like job applications. It's how can you boil down, you know, what you want to present so you can get that point across as quickly as possible uh, and most efficiently as possible. It's kind of like um, as an animator, your demo reel should be like your very, very best shot first and then everything that else is awesome and then your second best shot last. Yep. You want to wow but them in the beginning. No, no more than two minutes. Yeah. You know, you, you you want it concise and because you're only as you know you're only as good as your worst piece. Totally. That's it. So you can have something completely awesome, and then if you have something crap in the middle, in you no matter how awesome the last thing is, that's how that's where you're going to be judged at is your worst thing. And I would imagine it's the same thing with a pitch deck. You want totally. to wow them, and then have a bunch of cool stuff, and then wow them at the end. 
make it you want it because you know if you get let's say five or ten a day um you want you want to be the one that's remembered out of all those and if you're yep. pitching a bigger publisher uh, uh a really big publisher, um, they probably get a lot, so it's hard to wow them. Well, I mean, we saw the article last week from Jagex. They've just now started publishing, and he said they've already looked through 100 games. I mean, so it is extremely competitive. And so when you have the stuff, you know, when you're putting your package together to send out, I mean, we, what I always tell developers is publishers are looking for a reason to say no. I mean, maybe not literally, but, you know, if there's, you know, one or two little things in your proposal that are, you know, red flags that the next guy doesn't have, you know, you're going to get tossed. I mean, so and you, it could be you, simple. It could be like, um, like, a, let's say you're, you're listing things and you capitalize every single word, except for there's one where you didn't capitalize everything. That's kind of like, well, they, they didn't take enough attention to detail to check that. Exactly. I mean, and, and attention to detail is, is one of the easier things that, mm. you know, it's, it's, you can screw up on basically. And, and that goes both ways. I mean, we've had publishers that, you know, started working with developers and, and we say it when we talk about contract negotiations, you know, if the attention to detail is not there early on, or, you know, it's super hard to negotiate with this publisher and it's contentious <laughs> on the contract, it ain't going to get better. Grammar you know, matters. So, yeah, it, it's just like yeah. I would imagine if you're reading like a 15 page document from someone describing their game and it's super, super detailed. The thought of a publisher is like, oh, my God, I'm not sure I want to work with this person because if this exhausting. is how they're going to think. <laughs> yeah, it's, it takes a lot of energy. So you have to when you're writing a proposal or whatever it is that you're doing like that, you have to think from their perspective like um you know, I'm sure it's like, okay, at the beginning of the day, we get to look through proposals. And then after two hours in, you're like, okay, I just want this to be over. Everything looks the same. So you you really want to stand out and you really want to be the fam. Just that, notice we have I, the glasses Power Rangers here. Who's red? <laughs> that, that's why I like just a nice, even, you know, one to two minute either trailer or even just showing different parts of the gameplay really fast because you know the build will always be the the third thing i'll check out and if if i like the pitch deck and i like the video then i'll play the game to see if it feels good and if it if it works well but first just you know a video is super quick i i can take five minutes of time to quickly skim through the pitch deck and watch this video and see if it kind of grabs my interest we actually have a i have to dig up the link because it was in our old links thing, it's not in the new one. Uh, we put together an infographic of what you need to have in your pitch deck as a developer. Um, but I have no idea. Oh, I don't know where to find that link. So, what are you? What are you looking for right now, David? What are you, What are you on the hunt for as a publisher? So, our studio, we don't really, I guess, discriminate or favor any types of types of games so no no particular genres for us it's more kind of the qualities that come with the game so uh we really only look for premium games games that we see that can be you know we're we're a very um we we favor consoles and steam quite a bit so for us if the game has the possibility of going on steam and switch xbox playstation that's that's kind of what we for most if if it's going to be you know a secondary for for mobile that's fine we do have several mobile titles that are premium that we support but really kind of our bread and butter is you know the the, the premium uh steam and uh console titles um right now we're actually looking for games that take advantage of of twitch integration or that could take advantage of twitch integration we we definitely believe in in twitch as a platform um you know, even just as a way to I increase the views, increase the engagement, then the game doesn't need to be a Twitch game, but some sort of layer that really engages people. Um, we're, we're looking for games that have uh, either like longevity or some kind of like daily retention. It's really important to us right now, you know, finding the titles that are keeping players coming back day after day to play these games. 
And, and you um, know what? That that kind of thing can be simple. Something as simple as like being able to rename your character, right? Because people are, you know, on Twitch, they're like, "Oh, well, I'm going to name the characters after subscribers or whatever," and you know, that totally. that's totally a thing. Or they got to have awesome music. Star Vikings. <laughs> That's a good game. Anyways, go. I, I love I love Star Vikings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, for one of our our upcoming games, the Twitch integration is one of the couple things that we're doing is naming the characters to the the people in you know the, your your viewers in Twitch. Um, it, it makes people feel more involved. It makes people more engaged. And then if you can do some kind of like drops, you know, for the them as well, you know, that's great. Or uh, I even love, you know, Twitch extensions that are, uh, you know, add an overlay to the game and allow the, them to interact with it in some kind of way, or at least like, you know, if they're playing, I love like the Hearthstone, you know, extension where you can actually see the cards in the player's deck. I think stuff like that's really cool for, for viewers. Um, we love screwing over streamers. <laughs> yeah. So th those are kind of the main things that we're we're looking for right now. It's, it's, longevity it's being able to you know and, and i guess strong ip is important even though we don't take over any of the ip being able to find opportunities you know if if unfortunately if even stuff like uh if the game is in a custom engine it really closes a lot of doors in terms of like what kind of support you can get from other places because like logitech is not going to necessarily necessarily have a plugin that's going to support you know your your custom engine but if you're developing the game in unity that opens up a ton of doors not only with unity but also with all the the partners that kind of integrate with unity so wait i'm mid thought here uh, <laughs> it does all right so when you're talking about the daily retention, and that's one of the ways that, you know, the industry has evolved over the last like four or five years, you know, that used to be something that was just totally exclusively in mobile games. And now we're seeing, you know, the games as a service, meaning premium games too. And so the most recent thing I can think of is uh, we had Megacrit on a couple of weeks ago and in yeah. the, in Slay the Spire, there's a daily run. That you I've can been do. playing it. I play it every single day. The daily run on Slay of the Spire. And the only way, the only time awesome. I've actually ever beaten it was on one of the daily runs. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it's things like that that you know you really can't just tack on at the end as well. You know, when you're developing it, you can't. And I will say this: you cannot, in today's market, have the mentality that you're going to release your game and then you're done with maybe some patches. If you're not thinking about, you know, live ops, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a team of 50 people, you know, creating content and, you know, twitching around the different uh, variables in your in-app in purchases, even things like daily quests, you absolutely have to be, you know, thinking about this stuff. Yeah. And they're, they're a fantastic example because they even, you know, every week they have a patch that adds new stuff it's rebalancing stuff it's adding new cards it's giving me as a player a reason to go back because i want to see the changes that they make every week yep. all right i'm up against i got she got my alarm that i have a, a meeting to go to okay. um so if there's any other questions toss them out right now you know if not uh david thank you so much for coming on the show uh, I'm getting ready to flood chat with all of your, you know, info. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, awesome. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm mentally shot at the moment. I got too much stuff going on. Um, but, you know, there's all of, you know, there's your Discord, your Twitch channel, your Twitter, your Facebook. Um, reach all the out. everythings. You know, They've got a wonderful thing going on in the fact that, you know, they're not only publishing games, but they're actually, you know, actively helping, you know, the indie streams, the indie, you know, ecosystem as well. So, yeah. And we, we still develop as well. So we, yeah, that's true. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Andy, Tyler can you play us out? Thank you. What? I said, can you play us out? Play us out. All right. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. We'll be, well, I guess we'll be uh, here on Friday on, but we'll be on Mixer. Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll be here Friday because I'm already like 
too far thinking about something else. We'll be here on Friday. Okay. We may be looking into moving one show to Mixer later on. Right now, we're going to be here. Okay. Yeah, thank you guys for hanging out with us. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks, David. And we'll see you later, Jay. Here's some music. Have fun. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. One little question. Wait, we got one little question. Let's oh. hear it. And, and do you guys want to repost the the article as well? That might the publishing article that might help yeah. people as well. Yes, yes, I can do that. Does age matter for a publisher? What? No. In ter in terms of the age of the developers, I I believe no. And, you know, the, it's important to always have maturity in terms of uh, people that you work with. But I've worked with very young developers. I've worked with developers making their very first game, you know, that are still in college and have just seen some incredible talent. So it it doesn't it's very low on my list of, of priorities. Uh, <laughs> you know, it the, the biggest thing I would say is, you know, younger people tend to uh, not follow through with some of the stuff but if if the person is just a, a good genuine person that follows through on commitments and you know creates an awesome product it, it doesn't matter good answer nice. so so be good is the answer yeah be good <laughs> be good all right thank you guys thanks, thanks everybody